everybody, it's Talk Gnosis, and we're speaking to author Michelle Fogel about her new book, Paris Bohemian, which is uh, a fictionalized, but factual uh, biography, a uh, fictionalized historical novel about the great, world-changing, music-changing artist Eric Satie. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, Michelle. My pleasure. And the name of the book, again, is Paris Bohemian. Uh, you can get it on Amazon. I'm sure you, sure you can get it in other places. Uh, Michelle tells us all about it at the end of the show. Uh, you should pick it up. So he was a, a fascinating figure. He's my favorite composer. So I was really excited to to discover that Michelle had written this book because uh, I, I think uh, people are going to get a lot out of it. So, uh, Michelle, just just to dive right in, for, for people who aren't familiar, if you can give us sort of the elevator speech, the overview of uh, who was Eric Satie. So Eric Satie... Um was a composer but he had a very varied career and because of his when he was born and his lifespan really spanned from that era they refer to as the Belle Epoque all the way up until the 1920s and so that covers a whole lot of period of time and in that time he as I say had a very varied career he started off uh, studying at the conservatoire he was expelled from the conservatoire because he was unwilling to continue to, you know, follow their instructional methodology. He disagreed with that. He felt that it was oppressive and that it destroyed people's creativity. So they dismissed him, despite the fact that his instructors had in earlier of his evaluations considered him to be a really a rising star. Um, he then, as a young man, after doing a, his mandatory uh, army service, became a pianist in a cabaret, a very famous cabaret for which you've all seen the poster, mm -hmm. Le Chat Noir in Montmartre. Um, and there's really kind of where he got his sort of rebellious streak and found a voice for some of his creativity. Um, and it's also kind of important to understand that this particular period of time in the 1890s to around uh, 19 five roughly was a period of uh, real interesting uh, research and interest in the esoteric in Paris. Yeah. Um, and so he was very much immersed in that. And I kind of like to think about that period of time in history, which is kind of why I identified, and I'm sure we'll get to that in a minute, but very much like uh, 1960s Greenwich Village or San Francisco. It's a very bohemian lifestyle and very alternative ways of thinking about things. Of course, and they had their they had their drugs as well, which doesn't get talked about very much. But it was it, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, and from there, he had some traditional successes, and we'll talk, talk about that too when we talk about um, his relationship with Claude Debussy. But he did have some major works performed in the city through kind of alternative avenues and then found his way into the music hall. Um, and that was in part driven by the huge controversy that happened around the Dreyfus Affair in Paris and in France at that period of time that really made him decide to opt out of the classical music venue at that point and so he went into the music hall and did that for a number of years and that was during what we know here in 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 the united states and canada more as the time of ragtime mm -hmm. and so he created a lot of works in ragtime and that was really where he saw the greatest amount of uh, success i think in his his middle career he did eventually go back to school and get a degree in music at the school of cantorum that allowed him to uh to compose and be, he wanted the skills to be able to orchestrate and he didn't have them. So he did that. And then um, he sort of arrived in a sense, people started to discover him. Um, and he was deemed by the new younger up and coming composers like Stravinsky and like uh, Maurice Ravel as the precursor to the modern period. Yeah. And uh, that really kind of launched him into a, a long period of success. Um, and then World War I broke out, and that uh, put a damper on everything culture-wise in, in France uh, for the duration of the war. But then afterwards, he found himself doing a lot of 
uh, ballets and even the, one of the first actual soundtracks for a film. Um, so, and I think if he had survived, that's probably where he would have found his niche would be like a Danny Elfman or even a John Williams if he were alive today. Yeah. Oh, what inspired you to write a novel about Satie's life? And, and how did you balance fact and fiction in your narrative? So um, I was uh, 17 years old when my boyfriend and I hitchhiked in 1969 from Southern California up to Northern California for a big rock festival. And we heard one of the people that picked us up was they were playing Blood, Sweat and Tears. Of course. And what came on was variations on a theme from Eric Satie. And that was my first exposure to Satie. And I loved that. And that became like an anthem for the flower children for that whole generation. And so that stuck with me. And as I you know, went on with my life and uh, eventually got to a place where I wanted to pursue writing more. I, I decided that I wanted to know more about him as a composer. And so I started to do some research. And one of the first stories that popped up, and, and, and we talk about um, the ways that people have these ideas about Satie as an eccentric, was when they opened up his apartment in RK, that they found all those umbrellas. And I went, okay, what is that about? And so I went to then start really researching the man and, and researching his life and learning more and more about him. And that included a, a, a journey to Paris and to Normandy to walk the, walk the, the footsteps of Satie and to experience all, of, all that I possibly could about his life. Um, visiting the uh, cemetery where he is uh, interred and um, all of the places where his music was performed. I mean, I had a long laundry list of all of the different addresses that had some significance, and I went to everyone. So, uh, that, that, That's such a, a cool story. I really love. Uh, I'm the number one Al Cooper fan. I love Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, everybody, their second album opens up with them covering uh, Tati. They do an arrangement of his music. So make sure you check that out. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's so cool. That's amazing. It, it's almost like uh, fate, the, the spirit of Satie directing you. Um, Absolutely. And, yeah, it's, it's so amazing that you also got to, to do that research and uh, really, you know, immerse yourself in that way. So uh, you mentioned in passing he was known for his eccentric personality. You mentioned the, the famous umbrellas. Um, as an author, as an artist, how did you approach portraying his works, you know, his his, idios, uh, syncre his idiosyncrasies in your novel? And also a uh, an important question, how did you get into a head that's hard to get into? Well, I am by profession a licensed psychotherapist. And especially when I saw the hoarding behavior, I kind of went, hmm, okay, what, what is that about? And one of the things that we know about people who hoard, at least a common factor that seems to crop up again and again, is that th those are individuals who have um, unresolved catastrophic loss and grief in their life. Okay. And so what we know about Sati, and this is kind of part of what my research discovered, and I felt like what I wanted to I wasn't so much interested in trying to portray him as an eccentric, but to understand his behavior and why it looked like that. But what was it really underneath? And that, so that would I, I would say is my my approach. And he he did experience at a very early age a series of catastrophic losses in his life that affected him dramatically. I don't know if you want me to go into that, but well, you know why not? Yeah. So um, so. When he was when he was born, um, his family lived with the grandparents, the paternal grandparents in Hanfleur, Normandy, and Dad went into the National Guard and went off in the service. So that was kind of one of the first losses because he never really got to develop until later. Didn't really develop a good relationship with his father. His grandparents did not like his mother. His mother was Scottish, and she was a Protestant, and they were very very religious French Catholics. And so there was a tremendous amount of friction there. And so when dad came back, he moved the family to Paris. Mom gave birth to another baby girl and the baby died, probably crib death. And what, what we're told by most of the historical records is that shortly after that, and so the baby was about two or three months old when this happened. 
And dad, because he had mastery of so many languages, was gone a lot in the diplomatic corps. He took a position as a translator. He was gone a lot, and mom was left with the, the children in a Paris apartment where the air was really, really bad. Coal, coal fire. Um, so probably she died of crib death. Um, and then mom died suddenly. And dad's not even there. And so uh, you've got Eric and his younger brother, Conrad, and their little sister, Olga, all there. Mom's dead. Um, and so they get in touch with the dad. And uh, then the grandmother comes from Hanfleur and takes the children back to Normandy. And the sister, Olga, gets farmed out to an uncle. And Conrad and Eric are going to be raised by the grandparents. And then Eric's immediately put into boarding school. So imagine what that would do to you as a child. Baby sister dies. Dad is gone. Mom is dead. Then you get formed, farmed out to a bunch of strangers in a boarding school. And then grandmother dies. Yeah. Yeah, the, I, I think anybody can see how that had a, a huge impact on his personality to, or anybody's personality to go through all that, to say that at the very least. Right. So severe attachment issues, um, trust, is it safe to love? Is it safe to connect? Um, and then the other extreme, which we see with Susan Valadon, which is a extreme possessiveness yeah. in their relationship. So, but, so my goal was really just to understand and portray him to make sense of his behaviors and to help reader to understand his humanness and where those things came from. But I have to say to you, um, mm -hmm. this book, when the first draft, and it took many years to, to, to write this thing, it was a thousand pages when I first wrote it. There is so much I had to cut out. There's so much I had to take out because, um, you know, and I was in a very uh, helpful read and critique group, but it was, hard for me to to decide what was the story I was really telling and how was I going to tell it. And it took me a while to figure that out. And I, what, what seemed to have the most juice was the relationship with Debussy. And so it's like I then had to start paring everything else away. Um, yes, it's, uh, it, it, it's tragic. We have to kill our darlings. It, it makes for stronger writing. But uh, I, I would read a thousand page book about Sati. I, I don't know if there's others out there who would, but uh, you'd at least have one tale. Um, well, I mean, I do have some some thoughts or plans about maybe putting some of those chapters that got cut out, putting them up on, on um, Amazon on Kindle Vela yep. so that they could be read, you know, like a serial of the other pieces that, that we, that didn't make the cut. Right? Yeah. That'd be cool. Why not? They're there. So yeah. um, Michelle, what are some misconceptions about Eric Satie? I think some of the misconceptions about Eric Satie is really kind of fueled by people reading some kind of juicy little thing and not really understanding the context. And so they present it as if that's who he is. I think probably one of the, my favorite ones that they misconstrue is that he only ate white food. <laughs> I've so heard that one, right. And so that's, that was a piece of humoristic literature he wrote. So during that period of time when he was really coming out and having success, um, he started writing humoristic music and he wrote humoristic things. So he had this uh, whole book called A Mammal's Notebook um, where he there was just all of these um, things. And so it, that was that is an excerpt from a piece called A Musician's Day. And it was totally, you know, joking with people. Yeah. It was totally meant to be funny. And yet people take things like that out of context and try to use those as signs that he was this real weirdo when actually he, he wasn't. Yeah. Well, talking about some, some weird stuff that, that he was into, uh, can you tell us a bit about Satie's involvement with, you know, esoteric ideas, esoteric mm -hmm. uh, movements, and, and how this might have influenced his music and his philosophy relating to art? It, defin it definitely did, but it's important to see him in the context of the cultural milieu of Paris at large during this period of time. So just like as we might be familiar, you know, with the hippie movement and the movements towards consciousness and the taking of psychedelics and meditation and, and the role that the Beatles played in that in terms of leading people towards med transcendental meditation and all that stuff. 
The same kind of thing was going on in Paris in this period of time. This was a period of time, though, when people were just starting to, you know, academically study people's psychology, how the brain worked, and doing archaeological research. So it was really before even like the the Gnostic texts of Nagamadi were even discovered yet. This was so this was a time when you know, archaeologists and historians were really trying to discover everything that they could. And so there was a lot of interest. And during this period of time, there was an esoteric bookstore that opened up. And it was in the opera district um, by someone that had been very kind towards Eric and published some of his early music. And it had all of this esoteric work in it. And so Eric very much wanted to just absorb that. Um, he wanted to, he believed that the this kind of knowledge, that this kind of information had sort of, in a sense, special, unique, um, I want to say power, but it was sort of like if you had a composition that incorporated the, the golden ratio, for instance, it was going to be the perfect composition that for any listener was going to be mesmerizing. And I think when you listen to the Jim DePedes, you kind of go, yeah, I can see how that's true, right? Um, he, at the same time, was still a fairly religious Catholic. Um, before the the Jim DePedes, he'd written a work called The O'Geeves, which is a work that derived from him sitting in the Saint chapelle in Paris. And if you've ever been there, there are these amazing, huge windows, these tall windows that fill that space with kaleidoscopic majesty that is just unbelievable. And there's this um, ceramic polished tile on the walls. And so the, the light just bounces off of all of those surfaces. And it's like being inside of a kaleidoscope. It's just an absolutely amazing thing. And so that inspired his O'Gabe's work. So I don't think he limited himself to any particular line of mystical thought. I think he wanted all of it in every possible way and tried to infuse that into his music with the drive really of wanting to make it completely different than anybody else was creating. Um, and so he was definitely uh, a visionary and definitely ahead of his time in terms of that creativity. And that, in a sense, was what drew Claude Debussy to him. And it's reported that that's where they met, was in that bookstore. Okay. That uh, Debussy was there trying to do the same thing. However, Debussy was kind of hampered by his training because not only did he graduate from the conservatoire, but he was a prix de Rome. And so he got sent off to, you know, to learn all of that and to c compose some great masterwork. And he was completely and totally stifled and felt that that was a horrible experience. And when he came back to Paris, he was hungry and starving for anything that could enliven his compositions to not be stale and old and boring. And so that's kind of what I think what the two of them sort of came together. I think Satie saw Debussy as somebody who could open doors for him. And Debussy saw Satie as somebody who could point him in the direction of things to inspire him to create new and different things. And they formed a very, very close relationship that really went on for decades until the end where they really parted ways. Well, let's dive into that for uh, in a moment, because uh, as you've already mentioned, it is uh, very central to your book. But uh, staying on the topic of, of uh, the esoteric, esoterica, did anything surprise you about his involvement with esoterica? No. <laughs> Perfect. No, because when you when you really study the the milieu of Paris in this time, and you you look at all of th that was going on there. It, everybody was immersed in it. They were into seances and they were into expanding consciousness and they were they were eating strawberries dipped in ether. I mean, they were doing all kinds of things to try to expand their consciousness and understand that the, the nature of, of the universe and they would go to, uh, you know, lectures and so forth. It was kind of what everybody did for entertainment. You know, they would go to these lectures about this sort of thing or go to a seance. So 
And that is, of course, what sort of led Eric into his uh, relationship with uh, Josephine Peladan and the, the Rosicrucians, or Peladan's spin on the Rosicrucian um, ideology, if you will, um, where Eric actually had a wonderful success because the, the Rose Croix put on a salon that was to compete with the Beaux Arts Salon of traditional Parisian institutions. And they did this as an alternative. Um, and all they wanted was art of a mystical nature and music of a mystical nature. And all of the rest of that stuff was boring and leave it out. And so Eric was appointed the, the choir master for the uh, Rose Croix. And it gave him a position with a number of people, including some nobility that got involved to fund this, that allowed him for the first time to actually present his work in a huge environment where people could be awestruck by it. And that led to ongoing success, even though he and Peladen parted ways, it led um, Eric to get lots of contracts doing incidental music for plays and other productions that kind of really kept food on the table during this period of time when he was very, very poor living in Walmart. Yeah. So uh, the, I guess it's time to, to dive into the Debussy and, and Satie. And of course, uh, Satie's relationships are complex in general, but can you tell us more about his relationship with Debu uh, Debussy and uh, the role that it does play in your novel? So they were buddies. I mean, they shot pool together. They visited, hung out with each other at their houses. They were out in the cabarets at night. Um, Debussy was, as I say, he was classically trained, but he was floundering. When he came back from Rome, he was floundering, and it took him a while to actually figure out what he wanted to compose. And so the big door opener for him um really came as a result of Satie's inspiration. He was several times, Debussy was suicidal and Eric brought him back in a sense from the edge and gave him opportunities or gave him, the, in particular, I'm thinking about this uh, Peleus and Melisande that had been uh, a play and that they were gonna try to turn it into an opera and Eric had wanted to do it but it came too close to home and reminded him too much of his relationship with Suzanne. And so he handed off to Debussy and then Debussy did produce that and it really brought him tremendous amount of acclaim. So that was kind of their, their uh, the relationship was one in which they spent time together and they tried out ideas with each other. They would spend their weekends, you know, would. Eric would go over to Claude's house and they'd sit down at the piano and they'd show each other what they had been working on and what they were interested in. And sometimes they'd invite other people over and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, there's some very famous photographs of the, the two of them with Stravinsky. Stravinsky was in town in Paris that, um, you know, they shared all of that uh, same kind of camaraderie. Um, and so that's kind of how their relationship went on for a, a long period of time. But because Satie didn't have the, the credentials in a sense, he didn't in this period of time have the success that Debussy did where Debussy's career really took off. And uh, especially after afternoon for a fawn um, really took off and um, he started to become wealthy and Eric, just got poorer to the point where he couldn't even afford to stay in his apartment in Montmartre and Rue Court Courteau and had to move into a closet until he moved out to the suburbs and then had his studio there. But um, they continued to have that, that kind of relationship for many, many years where it was kind of a given that every Sunday, Eric was going to come over to Claude's house until Claude started touring and um, and then things started to kind of go sour in the later part of their relationship. Yeah. Good. Can you tell us more about that? I wish I had a nice list that I could give you of the, the compositions, but 
there was a there was borrowing between them. So there's certain compositions of Debussy that if you listen very carefully, you if you know Satie's work and you know it backwards and forwards, you can pick it out in Debussy's work. Yeah. And because Eric wasn't publishing this or it hadn't been published, the only way that Debussy would have heard it is in those Sunday salons when they would get together or if Eric had left his his music notebook there um, where you could hear numerous places where Eric's music is in Debussy's music. Um, the way that I portray it in the novel is just one discrete incident, but there was many um, of one of his ragtime songs, which when which Debussy disparaged trying to blend the popular style of music in with the classical grand musique. So he, Eric went off on that tangent and was playing ragtime. And so one of his ragtime songs, if you listen carefully to Debussy's, you, you will hear it, you see it, you go, oh my God, you realize that he's copied him. Um, and other complex relationships, you mentioned uh, Suzanne Belladon. Uh, who was she and what was her relationship with Satie? So she was, first and foremost, she had been an artist model for some of the most famous um, painters in Paris, impressionist painters. So um, if you can think of that, um, that picture of the umbrellas, that very famous picture of the umbrellas, that girl is Susan Balladon. She was a very beautiful, beautiful young woman, but she herself wanted to be a painter in her own right, which was very difficult to do. It was a male dominated field. And so uh, it was really hard. So she had um, set up a studio, a Montmartre, and she had kind of a patron among these um, Catalan artists that had come from Barcelona and were living in Montmartre. There's just a whole collection of these guys that had were living there. And one of them, um, Miguel Utrio and Suzanne were a item. She had gotten pregnant by Puvis de Chabonnet, who was the, uh, he had his art, an art school and she modeled for him. She modeled for Toulouse-Lautrec. She modeled for all of these guys, but she got pregnant and um, Miguel agreed to give the child his name. And so Maurice Yatrio, the famous um, painter, is their child. Um, but she didn't really love him. She, she just was kind of using him to survive as a patron of sorts. He was very in love with her. Um, she started an affair with Eric. She met him at a Christmas party. It was a New Year's party at Miguel's uh, house on Walmart. And she and Eric just glommed on to each other. Um, and he was kind of feeling like it was time anyway, because Claude had gotten a girlfriend and his best friend Patrice had gotten married. And so he's kind of feeling like I'm alone now. So he thought it was time. And so he got very, very serious with her and they just kind of glommed on to each other. But she was not, she always had another guy in the wings, another guy waiting in the wings. And she had had one before she met Eric and then she had others afterwards. And she at the time was involved with a, a stockbroker who was willing to let her paint full time, which is really what she wanted. She wasn't so much with these guys because she was in love with them. She wanted to be a painter and she had nobody to support her. And so I, the stockbroker was willing to let her paint and support her uh, as a patron um, in exchange for friends with benefits. Um, and that broke Eric's heart and he became insanely jealous and extremely depressed. And um, eventually he broke off the relationship with her in a very dramatic way. But it seems to have really 
made him, it just like sent him over the edge emotionally and psychologically. So it really sent him into a major depressive episode. And of course, you can imagine he'd been, if you work in a cabaret, you, you develop a pretty heavy duty drinking habit as well, which he did and was ultimately the cause of his death was his alcoholism. Um, so he really had a, uh, he just kind of fell off a cliff there for a while and it took him a while to pull himself back together after they broke up. Yeah. Um, his music still sounds fresh and experimental, modern. It really sounds ahead of his time in, in so many different ways. Uh, do you think that his his strong personality, his esoteric interests, his philosophy, did this lead to sort of glimpsing into the future? Do you think he was grasping something that was ahead of him? The, 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 what, what are your feelings on that? I think that Eric always believed that art and artists have to evolve, that they have to be always in the process of changing, that art is not something that we own, that we can hold on to, but rather we are the vessel through which the art flows from the muse. And so I think that that's kind of his philosophy was to find ways to channel the muse. And that's part of his esoteric uh, interest. So the, the creation of the Nociens, um, the creation of the Junipides. I think there's even, you see influences with, you know, Toir Marceau and Forme de Poix, his three pieces in the shape of a pear. The, the mystical quality that infuses all of that, um, that work comes, I think, from his desire to channel the muse through these mystical channels. Um, did he actually have this idea of how things should go in the future? I think he did on, in some sense. Um, but he always was trying to do something that nobody else did. And he encouraged all of his protégés in the later part of his life to do the same. Um, that there shouldn't be a school of Satie, that there shouldn't be a school of Debussy, that you needed to make your own path make your own unique path as an artist and bring something new into the world. Well, Michelle, I, I think it's almost time to wrap up, but, uh, but an important question, does Satie matter for the present world, for the modern world? I think definitely, especially that idea that, that art and music evolve and that while we can appreciate works of the past, it's really okay for it to change and develop new art forms. I mean, even if you just think about back then, there was classical music, and that was it. Yeah. Yeah, there was the cabaret. And you look at all the different genres of music that we have today. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well, let's uh, let's tell people all about uh, where to buy the book. Uh, did, did, tell people where to buy the book. Let's do the commercial. Everybody go out and get the book. Uh, we're always telling all people right. to buy books because we interview a lot of authors. But if you listen to the show, you like reading. So, hey, it's summertime when we're recording this. Head to the beach, pick up the book, <laughs> read it there. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. I'm actually exclusive to Amazon. So it's okay. available as an ebook or in paperback at this time. Um, and as I say, you know, stay tuned. I will probably try to put some of the lost chapters up on Kindle Bella. Perfect. Perfect. So it's Paris Bohemian, Michelle Fogel, and I have your uh, website address up on for those who are watching, for those listening. It's down in the show notes, as is a direct link to the book, michellefogel-author.com. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. It's been absolutely a pleasure. Uh, it's been awesome. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye, everybody.